everyone. It's Kate. Welcome back to another episode of the Omni Channel Marketer. Today, I have Matt Mullinex on the show. Matt is the co-founder and CEO of Huron, a men's body, hair, and skincare brand. Matt, super excited to have you on the show today. Thanks so much for joining. Likewise, Kate. Excited to dig in a little bit. So why don't you just start with your story? How did you, you know, what's your background? How did you come to found Huron? Yeah, um, kind of like boring baseball card stats. Um, I'm originally from Cincinnati, Ohio, went to school in the East Coast, uh, graduated in 08, pretended to play investment banker for a little bit at the start of the global recession. Um, that wasn't fantastic. Uh, quickly pivoted, left, went to Bonobos. And that's kind of where I got some early exposure into what is now like early stage D2C. Um, but in 2008, it was kind of a mouthful to describe what we were doing. It's like, oh, we're selling bright, brightly colored pants online to men, right? It was, it was not exactly an articulate tagline. I did that for a few years, ended up moving to Chicago, um, worked in uh, consumer private equity capacity. So investing in brands like Bonobos, um, which I found to be uh, an incredible experience and really my first kind of like foray into the broader personal care side of things. So we looked at a lot of traditional beauty and cosmetics brands, which for me was, was certainly an eye-opening experience because to date, uh, my kind of experience in the personal care category was, am I going to buy the neon green or the neon blue Dove for Men body wash this month? Um, so it was definitely uh, definitely a, a new field for me. Uh, after that, I went to business school and then sh launched here on shortly after graduation in, in 2017. Uh, my personal kind of affinity or gravitational pull for this category is, is kind of twofold. So professionally, kind of dating back to my experience as an investor, like really digging into all these amazing brands that were historically catering the, the female consumer. So brands like a drunk elephant, um, amazing brand stories, super cool packaging, amazing product. And I just thought there was a tremendous amount of white space for brands, maybe um, angling or targeting more towards guys. Uh, and then personally, I was just the kid that grew up with bad skin. So aside from like maybe being a, a bit muted in my body wash uh, search, uh, you know, for, for years, um, I really did struggle with bad skin. And I kind of ripped through more clear cell and oxy pads and clean and clear tubes than I'd ever care to admit. Um, it really got so bad to the point where, you know, I had gone on pro um, Accutane, I actually did that twice. Um, and finally, when I was out West for business school, I stumbled into a more premium or prestige beauty store, ended up buying face wash and it worked. So really the early inklings for Huron was, could you kind of connect that high level of clean ingredients, efficacy, um, clean formulations, et cetera, with a consumer cohort that was kind of just starting their personal care journey, or quite frankly, like didn't even know where to start. So that was kind of the impetus. Um, and yeah, you know, we, we launched in July of 2019 and we've been off to the races ever since. And so, uh, you know, targeting a brand in this white space to a, you know, consumer population that is less familiar with, like, how have you tackled that specific problem, um, you know, and educating that, that consumer? Yeah, I mean, and, and you hit the nail on the head with one of the words, and it's just education. I mean, that that is huge for us. Um, really kind of taking a step back, we felt that you know, one kind of common thread amongst the male psyche is like, you like to have like a known trusted source. So you might like going to the same, same particular barber, or you might have a suit tailor or a car mechanic. And it's like, nope, that's, that's my person. Uh, we wanted to be that person for this particular consumer. And the other thing we learned is uh, really leading with being human and telling relatable stories. And I think the humanization of brand is certainly a concept and a theme that has emerged a lot over the past few years, people really wanting to tie kind of a brand with a face, not necessarily being the face of a brand, but identifying like, hey, I share a lot of similarities with that person, or I really like what this brand and this person stands for. Um, so really kind of distilling down a lot of the awkwardness, quite frankly, of this category to real life kind of experiences and, and relatable personas. Um, and so where did, like, what was the first channel that you launched here on in? So when we launched on July 29th, 2019 at 1042 AM Eastern time, uh, we pushed go on our Shopify store. So we were predominantly D to C for the first few months uh, of our existence. Uh, and what did, you know, being D to C, why did you choose to launch that way? You know, I'm sure that you learned a lot from your you know, previous experiences with kind of that more D to C motion. Why was that an important channel for you to launch first? 
Yeah, I think just kind of previous experience with Bonobos and kind of investing in other kind of internet focused companies, um, you get immediate consumer feedback. Um, you can understand how people are shopping, what people are gravitating towards, what kind of becomes your hero product. And I think those early data points uh, were really insightful in thinking about how we wanted to ultimately shape the brand. But also it's just, quite frankly, much easier, right? Um, with Shopify and maybe a designer and some Google images, like you can stand up a site pretty easily. Uh, and I think that's certainly a low barrier of entry to anyone kind of looking to get into the space. So, you know, to from Bonobos to 2019, when you launched, I think the D2C landscape is changing a lot. Um, you know, notably what, you know, we're seeing and hearing across brands that we work with is, you know, rising caps um, and just the, the challenges that, you know, Facebook and Instagram um, kind of exhibit. So how have you been dealing with those challenges? And then, you know, how does your playbook adjust and evolve going forward? Yeah, good question. I mean, um, as much as you hit on a, a term that I loved earlier, education, you just hit on one that's like a triggering one for me, which is playbook. Like I can't stand that word. Um, that and authenticity are like my two biggest like buzzwords that just like really make my skin boil. Um, there, there is no playbook for brands. Like once a playbook has been written for a brand, that's their playbook. Your job is to etch your own. So I think for us, um, you know, we started early on Facebook and on Google. Um, and I was the media buyer. I had never bought media a day in my life previously, and I was absolutely awful at it. But what it allowed us to do in the really early stage with very minimal spend is just understand like how the machine works, right? Like what are what are the what are the signal strengths we should be looking for to understand is this ad working? Is this ad set working? Should we be tweaking X? How does retargeting work? How's that different from remarketing? And I think people are so quick to just like outsource things. So like, oh, that seems tough or that seems challenging, or I can't do this. Um, and it's really important to kind of really understand the infrastructural pillars across your brand. Um, because at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's money out the door, right? And you kind of have to be accountable for every dollar uh, that leaves your bank account and understanding how efficient is this? Is this actually working? Is it bringing people across the finish line? And if not, maybe it's time to pivot. Um, so anyways, like tons of learnings early on, we, we did kind of fall in line with a lot of other brands in terms of acquisition earlier on, but we've since kind of like broadened our, our aperture and appetite certainly since, since those early days. So how are you, you know, thinking about expanding channels? You started D2C, what other channels are you in? And, you know, how did you think about launching those channels? You know, how is that different than your you know, D2C process? Yeah. So in February of 2020, we launched on Amazon, which February of 2020, like diff different world uh, back then. Um, but one of the things we, we learned quickly was that we were attracting the attention and eyeballs and wallets of consumers everywhere. We were not, and kind of set out to be this way, but we were not just going to be a brand that only targeted the West Village and West Hollywood, but there were certainly markets that were non-coastal that were very, very important to us. And from there, Amazon made a ton of sense, right? Because if you're maybe a single guy living in a high rise in Detroit and you need hand soap and dish detergent and you're like, oh man, I also ran out of shampoo, like boom. It, it, it's such like a POS point of sale opportunity. So that really made sense for us because A, the low lift to get onto Amazon, quite frankly. And we thought we were building a lot of traction on the D2C side where once you kind of get that momentum crossing the chasm into Amazon helps build reviews and get the flywheel going. So that made a lot of sense for us to kind of venture off in that direction. And it's been one of our, our best channels to date. So what is the breakdown now approximately of kind of D2C versus Amazon sales? And then, you know, second question, when launching on Amazon, what were and, you know, what continue to be some of the different like tactics that you're focused on to be successful in that channel, which is, you know, a very different one than D2C? Yeah, sure. Um, probably won't share channel split per se, um, but I can say that it's changed immensely even since Q2 of last year. So as a lot of the iOS challenges started to emerge, we just said, hey, why don't we redivert a lot of spend that's typically been earmarked for D to C acquisition to this channel that we're kind of not giving as much attention to, and it's way more efficient. So we made that conscious effort kind of early in Q2 of last year, and it's been hugely rewarding. And I think that's just a result of um, a lot of our 
obviously our marketing efforts, we work with a great partner on the Amazon front, but our VP of marketing does a great job too of just understanding efficiency across the board. We look at not only channel level, MER marketing efficiency ratio, but also in totality. So we can kind of like play with this acquisition pool of capital and deploy it where we feel like it's best fit. So there's a lot of art and science that goes on behind the scenes to thinking about how we're fueling a lot of these acquisition channels. And in terms of like maybe some of the successes or challenges we've experienced on the channel, um, you know, I think one of the biggest things that that we learned quickly is the, the ability to test on site with Amazon. So we're constantly looking at um, changing listings, changing descriptions, headlines, uh, showing different like colors, like what do our carousel of photos look like? What is the creative presentation? I think one of the other things too, that was a net benefit that I don't think a lot of brands do is Amazon will kind of mark pricing to lowest common denominator, whether that's your D to C site, uh, or maybe a retailer like a Target or Walmart. However, with the way it treats your site is much different from kind of other third-party retailers in the sense that because we're only in two channels, meaning Amazon and D2C, we can actually charge a premium on Amazon and we don't get any slap on the wrist. So if we were selling our body wash for 16 on Amazon, but nine at Target, they would immediately mark Amazon pricing to nine. So it would allow us to... Uh, regain some of those profitability points and margin points that are historically lost on Amazon, which is known as kind of being a gross margin dilutive, but contribution margin, contribution margin accretive channel um, to even make it slightly more profitable. So again, learnings along the way, but 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 tons that we've uncovered over the past, geez, uh, three-ish years now, um, which is crazy to think. But, but yeah, tons of learning. Yeah. So being in those two channels and, you know, having that benefit to actually be able to charge a premium on Amazon, does that, you know, affect how you think about potentially entering other retail channels or other sales channels? Not necessarily. And I mean, I think, you know, we even saw in December of last year, I mean, some of our PDPs had upwards of a 30% conversion rate on page. So there wasn't a ton of hesitation to buy at these price points. Um, now, obviously the search intent and buying intent is much greater on Amazon. You go to the search bar, you're typing in X shampoo, like you're there to buy. You're not there to peruse necessarily. Um, but I think that was, again, was a really good signal strength that like people are coming back again and again to buy our products. Um, how we think about different retail relationships going forward is kind of dictated by the retailer, where if we explore mass, maybe one particular partner's like, hey, we really love your stuff, but it can't be above 12 bucks. Then we would have to kind of take a step back to say, well, we're committed to our formula and we would never dilute the formula to appease certain price point thresholds. So do we need to reduce the packaging? Like what else can we kind of remove, remove from the cost structure to get to where we need to get? Um, but maybe more prestige or premium um, outlets like a $16 and $18, $14 price point is totally fine. So I think it is really retailer dependent, um, but you want to make sure that the the messaging, the ethos is kind of consistent throughout. Um, so again, someone's not buying X at 16, but X somewhere else at 14, like it just creates a lot of confusion. Uh, actually leads me into my next question. How do you think about that end-to-end -end brand experience, um, you know, for your consumer? And especially as you, you know, right now are, you know, a dual channel, omni-channel brand, but, you know, we'll likely continue to expand those channels. Every touch point is super important. So whether it's uh, on-site experience as the first time of a potential customer or consumer of Huron, all the way to follow-up email flows to how we think about hosting IRL events. Like it, there's gotta be consistent themes in terms of speak, how we talk about the product, how we position the product, um, but also just quite frankly, how we engage with our base. Like it's meant to be a very relatable down to earth, almost like text worthy um, brand or friend that like wants to maintain that relationship. So that informs again, a lot of the comms and our marketing team and content team does a great job of making sure that like when we brief every email, when we brief every SMS, like there's consistent comms threads and the sound is the same throughout so that again, you're not getting mixed messaging from us. Um, and I think that's super important and something that easily gets lost. As you think about working with the agency X for email or working with the agency Y for SMS or designer and, you know, developer Z for site, like the moment you start to invite more touch points, 
that's when kind of like your firm grasp of brand tonality, et cetera, can, can really escape you. So it's certainly something that you need to keep eyes on at all times. Do you find that any of your customers are, you know, switching between channels or is your Amazon customer different than your G2C customer? How do you, you know, figure these things out and, you know, what are your different opportunities to kind of bridge those, those gaps? Yeah, anecdotally, there is some data on Amazon where you can kind of see how many folks, um, well, there's kind of like match back opportunities where you can see like, okay, this person was a DTC customer based on shipping address. And we know they were previously an FBM customer, so you can kind of marry the two. Uh, I've heard some data previously where like the highest a brand has ever been is like 10% cross chasm share. So, so they really are siloed in terms of this person is more of a DTC subscriber. I'm going to the website. Uh, website or bust, or it's like, no, um, I'm, I'm an Amazon truest because I'm never buying one thing. It's always like a few things at a time. And it just makes it so much more convenient to do things that way. So there really are kind of two separate worlds out there. Um, but again, trying to keep same brand touch points, context, voice, et cetera, across the two channels at all times. Um, could you talk to us about any uh, like failures in, in building the brand that could be relevant to, you know, others looking to build and expand their own? Sure. Um, I mean, this in itself could probably take an hour. Uh, mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest challenges early on, by default, anyone who's who's starting on this journey, there's some degree of type A in you, right? Like you, because you're you're on a mission to do something better or different than what is currently out there. So there there innately is like a hard charging element uh, for you, the founder. I think what becomes really early, what, what becomes difficult very early on is having kind of an honest conversation with yourself around what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, and how not to spend too much time trying to turn a weakness into a strength. Versus saying like, look, here's 70% of the things that I'm really good at. I'm going to focus in this direction. And I either need to assess whether or not the other 30% is like mission critical to what we're doing today. If it is, I need to find someone else to do it. If not, we can table it and figure it out later. But I feel like in the early days, I wasted a lot of time like trying to be the best Facebook media buyer, trying to do X versus like, hey, here's kind of like my core competency. And this is why I feel like we can propel the brand, which is why we started here on like, let's focus here and continue to move the needle here versus kind of worrying about what's over here, which eventually becomes a noise and a distraction. Yep. Makes complete sense. So I've heard it described, I think as like a, your zone of excellence, like what are you good at? And do you actually enjoy doing and do that really, really well? And then bring in amazing people to supplement those, those skill sets that, um, that maybe you're, you know, less strong. I, I could definitely relate to, relate to that and the, and the type A part. Um, okay. Something you're bold about, uh, bold or passionate about. I think consumers or folks rather, um, but who maybe start a consumer business, uh, who ultimately found something are in the best position when they are their own consumer. And what I mean by that is, I wake up every morning knowing exactly who we're fighting for every day on a day on a day to day basis because it was me 10 years ago, right? It was the guy who was on Friday nights combing the aisles of CVS, hoping something would uh, fare a little bit better for his skin so that like he wasn't embarrassed to go to work or wasn't embarrassed to go out. And like that is such a motivating factor to me. Like I have no direct connection to the B2B dental software space. And like, I couldn't imagine ever doing something in there. No offense to anyone who operates a business in that category. But like, for me, it just, it wouldn't work because like the way I view this journey, I haven't worked a day in four years. Like I fly out of bed being like, great, today's a new day. Like sure there'll be challenges and sure there'll be hiccups and bumps along the way, but it is so fun to think about what we're doing for consumers at various stages, of their personal care lives and journeys, but also just on a day-to-day -day basis. And we get probably five to 10 emails a day um, in and around like how we're changing or impacting self-confidence, self-esteem. And like, that's, that's really, really empowering and really, really motivating. And I think we got here because it's, it's something that like I was wildly passionate because I felt like I was the consumer that was being served. So it often gets overlooked because people want to chase money and people want to be in web three and crypto, blah, blah, blah. but like to the extent you can like actually pursue something you're wildly passionate about and find an intersection where 
uh, you feel like you have somewhat of a professional edge and mix that with like a, a personal connection. That's like a really dangerous place to operate dangerous in like the, the good way. Um, because you just have so much motivation and inspiration behind you. Yeah. It, it makes complete sense. Build for a prop, like a real problem that you resonate with that, um, you have the ability to, you know, have and help this greater mission. I, I love that, Matt. Thanks for sharing that. Okay, lightning round to wrap things up here. Favorite omni-channel brand? Ooh, uh, Liquid Death has to be. Uh, I agree. Thing you wish you could change about our industry? Aside from the use of playbook and authenticity, um, is it that you think those words are cliche? It, it, they're just like filler words to me. Like people think that like they, 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 that they carry weight, but now they carry like absolutely no weight. Um, quite honestly, like I, I wish there were more, more like founder stories that were promoted because again, like I think there's been this wild emergence of the creator economy because there is a creator with a presence who then's like, oh, well, I can make a cosmetics brand or I can start a fast food brand. But where we kind of like leapfrog the middle step, which is what about founders who have started brands because they were solving a problem or addressing a, a, a pain point? I don't think the spotlight was ever really highlighted on those folks. And I, I wish that was something that was more prevalent. Well, I'm happy to be sharing your story. It is honestly so fun for me to hear different founder stories. I, um, I, I love this so much. Uh, favorite podcast? Uh, aside from this one, obviously. Um, oh, that yes, uh, exactly. I really like the All In podcast, which is like so corny and such a cheesy answer, but it's like ninety minutes of like literally the week's current events uh, packed into one, as discussed by four billionaires. Which again is like kind of like tough to listen to at times, but it's it's one that it's kind of on my weekly routine. Uh, favorite newsletter. Oh, um, geez, I've unsubscribed to so many of them over the past. Uh, it's funny. Some people uh, love them. And then there's just, there's just like this deluge of newsletters that it's like unsubscribe. Need this that's, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, I think there've been a few within the D2C uh, ecosystem that emerged. Like Eli has a tremendous one in and around CX. Nate Rosen has an amazing one in and around all things CPG. I love um, Nate. Yeah. And I, like, I think like I find myself opening up like 40 tabs with each. So just based on click behavior alone, I'd put those probably in my top two. I love that. Favorite social media channel. So I have to admit to saying TikTok, but, but no, it's, <laughs> well, I'll say, I mean, that's where I spend the most time. Um, I find it like wildly informative, like educational, um, yes and kind of entertaining at the same and time. And are you guys using TikTok as a, a channel to reach your customer? We have a bit of an organic presence. We, we've we've kind of dabbled in and out of paid um, with not too, too much success. So we've done like some organic stuff, um, but probably not as much or consistent as we should be. Favorite book? Power of Habit. And then events that you're planning on going this to this year that you're excited about or an event? Ooh, good question. Um, I'm actually going to the Whaley's event uh, for Triple Whale um, next week, I guess, in Austin, which will be which will be really exciting. I, I mean, I'm just excited in general for kind of like the reemergence of events, yeah. Because I think like brand building and opportunities to meet customers IRL, like th those things are so core to what we want to do that you know the past two plus years have kind of sidelined us from doing that. So. We've been partnering with a lot of run clubs. We do like coffee. We'll sponsor coffee after these run clubs. Like we're doing happy hours. Like, and, and that to me is like the most rewarding way to kind of meet customers and like even not even customers, like supporters and brand friends. So um, just super pumped about events and IRL opportunities in general. I, I could not agree more. You know, meeting with different customers and partners in person, there's just like magic that happens in a way that you can't totally. replicate over Zoom. So I agree with you on that. Matt, thank you so much for taking the time. Really enjoyed this um, and so excited to have you on the show. Yes, thanks, you thanks so much for having me. If you liked this podcast, follow me and The Bridge page on LinkedIn and Twitter for hot takes and tactical advice. If you really loved today's episode, we'd love a review on the podcasting platform of your choice, Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Thanks for listening.